Thank you. Thanks. Thanks all for for having me. Uh, my name is Brad, and and until Hakeem's session, I thought that I was a web designer and developer, and uh, now I realize I am a shallow husk of a human being <laughs> that is going to spend the next year in a dark room figuring out what to do with my life. So, anyways. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, being here. I know it's after lunch, so you might be feeling a bit like my dog Ziggy, but please hang in there. I hope you got caffeine, because uh, we're going to talk about design systems. Uh, I absolutely, absolutely loved uh, 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 Bashank. Uh, did I get that right or no? Uh, her, her talk where she was saying that design system is sort of an unfortunate name. I wholeheartedly uh, agree with that sentiment, because it's it's a bit like... Uh, too literal of a name, right? That's, oh, here's this thing that designers do, right? Just like you think that, that athlete's foot, right? It's like, oh, I know what that is. And then you're like, no, that's not what that is uh, at all. So, uh, so it's interesting. Words are funny. Uh, but it, it isn't just about designers. It's about how an entire organization designs and builds products. There's many different definitions of what a design system is, and this is sort of what I hang my hat on. But again, the, the emphasis is on uh, design, and a lot of people get this, uh, I think, uh, too narrow of a view of what this is, especially now that we have tools like Sketch uh, that allow these sort of nested symbols, and I go into talk to a lot of organizations, and they say, oh yeah, we have we have our design system, and here's our Sketch library, and that's the extent of their, their design system. But a sketch library is not a design system uh, because you can draw a picture of a toaster. And in fact, you could create more efficient ways to draw that picture of a toaster, right? You know, here's all the component parts of that toaster. But ultimately, at the end of the day, you still just have a picture of a toaster. It will not make you toast. Right, And the problem is, is that this emphasis on these sort of static design tools leads to uh, the same problem we've always had, right? Where <laughs> we go through 18 rounds of design revisions and, you know, sort of scooting things around and making everything pixel perfect. And then we finally hand it off to the, to the developers and throw a Zeppelin link at them or whatever and say, here, build this out in negative three weeks. Have fun. Right? And of course, the end result is something that nobody's particularly excited about, right? Any designers in the audience uh, uh, don't put a link to the live website in your design portfolio, right? <laughs> <They're> like, <laughs> look at this beautiful thing. Don't look at the actual piece of shit live product, right? Like, <laughs> over here on my Behance, over here on my dribble shots, right? So what I want to talk, uh, emphasize here is that the heart and soul of a design system is this code library of reusable UI components that actually power real software applications, things like websites that you could visit at a URL, and whenever you hit the home page, you see the design system in action. So that's what we're going to talk about, is how to sort of prioritize that across the entire, uh, entire journey of creating a design system, right? So you know, selling a design system, kicking off a design system, planning on how we're going to execute the design system, actually designing and building the actual system, launching a design system, what does that mean? And then crucially, how do we maintain a design system over time? So we're going to start with the sales process. And one of the best things that I love to do uh, when it comes to selling a design system is making everyone feel the pain of inconsistent user interfaces. So uh, I, I like to conduct what I call a UI interface inventory, where we sort of get together and we screen cap all of the various uh, sort of unique button styles and form uh, field component styles that we encounter and different icon styles and the seven different flavor, flavors of, of social media icons and things like that. Right? But what I love to emphasize here, especially from a technical perspective, is that all of this represents, each one of these buttons represents time and energy and dev effort and design effort and QA effort, right? And, and all of that, right? And when you multiply that across all of your different products, all of your different services, that's a hell of a lot of effort, right? But even sort of the cruel joke is even if things look the same on the front end, right, under the hood, it might be very, very, very different. All of these uh, apparently are, are, are valid ways of, of uh, styling uh, a button or you know, sort of getting into all of that. I'll sort of leave some of those ones aside for now just because I don't think I understand them. But anyways, what if we could recognize that maybe 
instead of all those different instances of the buttons, we could create a button component that uh, is flexible and capable enough to travel to all the places we need buttons, right? And that's what a design system is all about. If you look at a button, there's a few different properties it can take, right? But we can sort of get our hands around them, right? It could be a link, right? A button sort of looks like a button, but it takes you to another uh, part of an experience. It could be a submit button that submits a form or something like that. It could be, it could have an icon after it. It could have an icon before it. <laughs> it could be an icon only. It could be like Hakeem showed, a loading button. It could be a disabled state button. It could be, what do you call these? Like hollow buttons, ghost buttons, uh, something like that, right? Different stylistic uh, sort of button treatments. Big buttons, small buttons. <laughs> Block level buttons that sort of fill the container, right? Buttons that look like text links, things like that, right? But the idea is to sort of capture all of the different sort of flavors and variations and, and properties of that button and create this re resilient, reusable component that allows you to sort of centralize all of those properties in one, under one roof. So there are many benefits of a design system. The big one is sort of reducing technical debt, right? From a code base standpoint, right, we have a bunch of spaghetti, right? And we have to sort of whittle away at that spaghetti and, and land in a place where we're actually, you know, in a more proactive state with our code base rather than sort of just constantly taking a machete to a bunch of old crappy code and, and all of that, right? We want to be able to sort of iterate over our products uh, uh, more efficiently and get them out the door, right? So we want to reduce technical debt, obviously. Probably one of the biggest uh, advantages of a design system, of course, is faster production, right? So less time, as Josh was saying uh, uh, during the Q&A of his talk, sort of like getting that settled science like in the design system so that it frees designers and developers up for more pressing problems, right? Not, rather than this sort of, you know, regurgitating the same uh, markup for a card component for the 15th time, right? And because we're saving that time, and instead of that rote regurgitation, we could instead, right, move into higher quality production. So we could be, you know, sort of focusing on fun stuff and improvements like, uh, I don't know, maybe a hover state menu that has some crazy ass SVG stuff in there, right? And focusing on that rather than having to build it from scratch every time you need one of those, right? Reducing QA efforts, right? By being able to sort of zero in and hone in on these, these uh, specific components, we're able to sort of make sure that the component itself is rock solid. So when we deploy it to all these different places, we know we don't have to check that stuff again and again, right? It also allows the potential for adding new technology, sort of moving from one sort of flavor, you know, JavaScript flavor, flavor of the month to another one, ends up being a bit of a lateral move, right? Once you get through spaghetti land and you have a system, you're able to sort of roll out maybe different flavors of that design system a little easier and explore and adopt new technologies faster. It's also a useful reference to keep coming back to. Like, how do we you know, use this? What component do we reach for? Why would we use an accordion over tabs, right? And, and sort of having this sort of design system and the, and the documentation to go with it can help with that. And then crucially, it serves as a future-friendly foundation, which means that you know, even if you were to do a big honk and redesign of your entire brand and stuff, you're still going to have buttons, you're still going to have form fields, you're still going to have cards, you're still going to have all of this stuff. So you can sort of thoughtfully and deliberately sort of evolve and maybe even sort of rebrand and rebuild uh, in, a, in a more deliberate way. So those benefits of design systems are why everyone is embarking on this journey. So when we get through the sales process and get everyone on board with a uh, design system effort, we move into our kickoff. And one of the first things we do when we start working with clients on their design system efforts is really just talk to people, right? This has been a theme throughout the day. It's like talk to users, get to know what their problems are, get to know, you know, what, uh, you know, what they need in order to be successful. And when we think about the users of a design system, right? A lot of times it's people like us, right? It's the, it's the product teams, the, the designers and the developers and the product owners. And of course, we should include end users in the process and talk to them as well. But it's sort of getting a lay of the land of, of what a design system at that organization needs to do in order to be fruitful and, and effective. And from a technical side, 
I'm always eager to learn. Okay, <laughs> what are your products made from? Does anybody work? Raise your hand. <laughs> Drupal gets chuckles, really? Okay. All right. I don't know what that's. A... How many people work at an environment uh, or at, at a, a company or, or for companies where you're, you're dealing exclusively with one sort of environment? And that could be Drupal. That could be Angular. That could be Django. That could be Ruby. That could be Vue. That could be React. That could be WordPress. But it's like one thing. Like you, you're like a WordPress shot. Like raise your hands high. Okay, good for you. Lucky you. <laughs> How many people work at a place where it's like, oh, we our marketing site is running on WordPress and our actual application is running on React? Like so, you have like two different things that you're dealing with. Okay. How about something like this? Where you have, yeah, you so it's like, okay, we got some stuff in this, some stuff in this, some stuff in this. Uh, but it's like, okay, I can still get my hands around that. How many people work at places like that? <laughs> yeah? And really, I, I think even those people that are sort of raising their hands with the, the, the smaller one, it's like once you broaden the net to your careers page and your blog and your other stuff that you don't necessarily think of as in your realm, uh, it actually starts to get a little like this, right? Got some stuff in WordPress, some old ass ASP.NET stuff, right? And you're like, ah. So how are we gonna deal with that? <laughs> so at the end of the day, uh, your users don't care, right? Your users don't give a shit that your blog's built in WordPress and the dashboard is built in Vue and the other parts of the application are built in that old crusty ASP.NET stuff, right? They see you and perceive you as a singular entity, right? They see you as a, as a singular brand with a singular product. So that's the sort of spirit of a design system is to sort of create this cohesive, coherent user experience, irrespective of what technology is going on under the hood. So how do we plan for this, <laughs> right? How in the hell are we going to do all of that? The answer is we're not. Right, at least not at least not now. So let's let's sort of turn this sort of hypothetical into a, a, a more concrete example. So let's say we have our ASP, our WordPress, and our, our all of that stuff. Let's let's turn this into say like a, a fashion company of sorts. I don't know. And they have a fashion design app, a fashion merchandising app, an e-commerce store. They have a you know HR app and a media center and all this stuff. I don't know. We're just making this up. But what we're going to do is we're going to sort of start making some sense out of this tech landscape, right? And we're gonna do a little sort of KonMari action here, right? So we have uh, <laughs> some different things going on. So let's take a look at, at our media center that's built in Adobe uh, AEM or whatever. And we're like, oh, that's actually not really something that's, that's publishing like a, a UI. So this is actually just our repository for all of our, our images and assets and stuff like that. So we can, it's like KonMari with a flamethrower, which, um, I hear that's coming in season two of the show. I would totally watch that, by the way. That would be a way more entertaining show. Like, Rhea Kondo just like goes over to people's houses with a flamethrower. Anyways, let's talk about uh, our old crusty HR app uh, in the ASP.NET stuff. What are we gonna do about that? The answer is, you know what? At the end of the day, we have to pick and choose our battles and poor people in HR are just going to continue to have to suffer, right? Sorry, but that's out of our realm, right? We're not gonna deal with that with the design system. How about this point of sale app? And this is actually built in Vue, right? Some enterprising developer was like, we're gonna use Vue on this project. And so I was like, okay. Vue's cool, it stays. So we sort of, sort of wanna hang out. <laughs> we're like, no, let's not, let's not get too, yeah. All right. Let's talk about these other ones. We sort of have these like older versions of React and older versions of, of Drupal. We're gonna flip those over to the latest version. Like we have a migration strategy for those, right? So that, now we're starting to, it's feeling a little bit better. And how about this lookbook one? This one is sort of an outlier. It's uh, uh, an, an uh, old Angular app, which I'm sure some people have lying around. And we're saying, you know, 
The new season is upon us. If anybody's familiar with the fashion world, right? It's a very seasonal thing. So the new lookbook's coming out. This old one's sort of built in Angular. And it's time to sort of rebuild that, right? We're going to redesign this app. We're going to, uh, you know, sort of launch it and all of that. So we're actually going to use this as an opportunity to refactor into using React, right? And why are we refactoring to React? Because React. <laughs> if there's one theme I've learned in all of my excursions in consultancy land is that React. And I ask, <laughs> how did you arrive at React? And they're like, eh, React. <laughs> but literally 95% of your code base is this old Java, uh, Java stack. Uh, how are you going to sort of serve the design system to this uh, Java uh, framework and, and Java architecture? And they're like, mm-hmm, React. <laughs> OK. React it is then. So we're going to use this as an opportunity to build our uh, design system, to start our design system through redesigning this lookbook. Now, this is, uh, uh, this is the trick here, and we're going to talk about this in a second. So this lookbook is a real product that needs to launch, right, sometime in the next quarter or something. So here's our opportunity. One mistake that we see time and time again is teams going off on their lonesome and saying, OK, we're going to create a card, we're going to create a button, we're going to create a header, we're going to create this typography system. And all of it's just this sort of off to the side design exercise and development exercise is so incredibly important for uh, your design system to actually power real software. So that's the trick, is to sort of use this lookbook project to actually create our design system, and then that in turn is going to sort of help power these other applications. My colleague Dan Mall talks about this, wrote a really great post about this concept of design, uh, uh, design system pilot projects. And what pilot projects are, as Dan says, is like, sort of like a TV pilot, right? where instead of having to sort of invest in the entire concept, right, you're able to sort of do a quick pilot project, to do a quick uh, uh, pilot episode to see how it sort of tests with an audience and all of that stuff. And so similarly, application pilots are a good foundation for ensuring your design systems, design and code are battle tested, right? So in other words, you don't have to bite everything off at once. Like what's a quick win? What's like a quick and easy win that actually gets us uh, our design system uh, foundation? And Dan talks that there's sort of a sweet spot in a, in a product roadmap where they haven't started designing and building things yet, but they know it's going to be built, right? So for our lookbook, we're like, okay, we know the lookbook's gonna happen. We haven't started the design and development process yet, so here's our sweet spot. So this is a great opportunity for that. There's other uh, uh, criteria for choosing pilot projects at your company or client's company. Uh, potential for common components and patterns, right? Like, what does this give us? Right? If you work for an e-commerce company, maybe you're in the process or thinking about redesigning the checkout flow. Well, that's great. That gives you a bunch of form fields. That gives you some navigation and some other elements and our buttons, of course, and stuff like that. So that's fantastic. And you want to look for a healthy cross-section of all of the different components that your organization needs. The scope of the work, it should not be Let's redesign the entire organization's ecosystem, right? Like that's too big of a scope. So you want like a page or a slice of an application that you could sort of bite off and, and, and churn out in the next, you know, sort of couple weeks or couple months at, at most. The technical feasibility uh, and independence of a project is really important, right? So you don't want to have to re-architect the entire Java <laughs> stack in order to adopt the design system. So you want something where it's like, it's like a, maybe a quick uh, refactor or something that's more of like a lateral move, sort of moving from like Angular to React. It's like, okay, that seems like, that seems reasonable, I guess. Right? But then also from like a, a political or cultural standpoint, we want to sort of have an available champion, somebody who's able to sort of you know, work with you as you create the design system. It's a bit like flying the airplane at, or building the airplane as you're flying it. So you want somebody who's sort of malleable and willing and able to roll with the punches as you sort of you know, stand up the design system, especially in the early days. It's very, very sort of volatile. And so you need somebody that's, that's going to be cool with that, but then also crucially come out the other end and be an advocate, an evangelist for the design system. Like, yeah, we, we use the design system and we thought it was really good, it was really helpful. 
And that sort of leads to the, the last criteria point, like can you hold up this pilot project as like a, look at what we did with the lookbook, right? Like this is so cool when everybody else looks at that across the organization, it's like, oh wow, we wanna do that too. So pilot projects are a great way of actually making sure that your design system powers real applications. So where do we build the design system? So this is something that comes up a lot. Uh, you know, if you look at a tech stack, there's like a bunch of stuff that goes in there. Like, you know, like npm install your application code base, and then you like go walk the dog, and you take a nap, and then you make dinner, go to bed, wake up the next morning, take a long run, casual breakfast, and then come to your computer, and of course, things are almost done installing, right? So that's, uh, and, and fine, whatever. But the problem is, is that the sort of UI code, right, part of it is, you know, do we really need this giant iceberg of like technical dependencies just to like make a button blue? <laughs> Probably not, right? So I think it's really important to sort of recognize that the UI code is, is really sort of like a sliver of all of this. And we could actually sort of create an environment that allows us to really optimize and sort of focus on that UI code, right? So I call this a front-end workshop environment. And there's a bunch of different tools out there for that. Uh, one I work on is called Pattern Lab. Uh, there's Storybook for sort of more like sort of JavaScript framework-y things. There's Fractal and a bunch of other tools that basically help teams visualize independent components. So this is for uh, a client of ours right now, where it's like, okay, here's our date picker component. We're able to zero in and visualize that component. Hakeem was showing uh, his version of that as well. And you can see it's like really helpful to sort of just zero in on that component and sort of play around with it and test it and build it and iterate over it there. But then also crucially, and this is what, uh, especially storybook uh, users, I often notice that they tend to still use the actual application for the full screens, the actual sort of compositions of all of these components stitched together to represent a real product scenario. But what we end up doing in Pattern Lab or Storybook or Fractal or whatever is sort of actually doing all of our front end code in this environment. And what this allows us to do is to articulate different product scenarios. Uh, this is for a project we did for the Cosmopolitan Hotel in Las Vegas. And we are able to sort of show what it looked like if you're logged in. And uh, we have this sort of banner here that is, uh, you know, how many points you have, you know, sort of like frequent flyer miles or whatever hotel points. But what if you're this tier or a platinum member or, you know, this, this other one and stuff like that? Or what if you're not logged in? What does that look like? Right? So we're able to articulate all of these different uh, product scenarios without having to build that actual functionality, right? We're not having to build the API for that. We're not actually able to, you know, we're not wiring it up to any CMS or anything like that. So we're able to just sort of visualize all of this stuff, prototype it out, and make a sturdy uh, front end code base. And then once we're sort of happy with that, then we're able to plug it in and actually sort of build it for real and wire it up for real. So coming back to this for our lookbook project, we're not going to sort of just design and build the lookbook project uh, or, or the UI in the lookbook application. We're instead going to sort of put that back and we're going to introduce our front end workshop environment. And we're going to sort of build that stuff there, right? We're going to sort of bring over the UI and then that's where we're going to do this and that's where we're going to sort of, you know, export our design system from and then that in turn will get fed into the actual product. How are we going to code this? Uh, this is where things get a little messy because as it turns out, developers, I don't, have you ever noticed this? Like developers have opinions about things. It's like really strange. Like it, it's happened once or twice where like I've con gone into a place and one developer has a different opinion than another developer. It's very, it doesn't happen all the time, but like sometimes, it's very strange. But uh, when I work with different front end teams, I actually created, um, uh, a little questionnaire. It's like the front end guidelines questionnaire. And it asks questions like, what principles do we want to follow when writing HTML, right? How do we write our CSS? What does commenting look like? Do we want to commit to spaces or tabs? And yes, we go there, right? 
And this is important. So we get all these developers in a room together, all the senior people and all that stuff. We make some decisions on how we're going to architect and code this design system because it's reflective of the entire development organization, right? So it's really important for it to sort of codify the best practices of the organization in the design system. And then the fun part is, is that once we sort of pontificate and all of that stuff and make some decisions, then I have everybody fire up a code pen and I said, okay, using the conventions we all just agreed to, let's build this component. And we give, you know, 15, 20 minutes or whatever for each, each developer to make this. And then we go around the room and watch each other sort of laugh and cry and all of that stuff because it's really funny how you could say you do something one way and then in reality, doesn't quite work out that way. But this is a great exercise. Before you get started building the design system, you don't have to like refactor Brian's code, right? As you're actually getting into crunch time, you're able to sort of get everyone aligned so that every, every developer is writing things uh, the same way. And then crucially, there's all these other great tools out there, of course, like ESLint and StyleLint, CSSLint and Prettier that sort of help snap uh, this stuff into place and will yell at you if you deviate from that stuff, right? And this, this stuff could be set up sort of broadly or, or really strictly or whatever, but at the end of the day, I tell you what, having stuff like this, pretty nice, right? Definitely helps to just sort of say, okay, here's our convention, we're baking them into our workflow, now you don't know if it was this person or this person or this person that wrote that code, right? That's the objective there. You want to write as a, as a, as a whole team. CSS, how are we going to style this thing? Um, I'm told that this is a way people style things now. Um, I'm going to leave this alone for right now, but I'm also just going to, going to maybe, you know, try to, try to suppress my opinions. Uh, one thing that I do encounter whenever I sort of encounter this stuff is it's like, I'm not saying it's not without its merits or, or anything like that, but a lot of times, you know, all of those bubbles, right, with all those different products and all those different tech stacks, I feel like we sort of lose sight of that. It's like, for my application, right, we're going to do this because this is clearly the best way. And then in the other bubble, they're like, my application, this is clearly the best way. We got to do it this way, right? So it's, it's really helpful to sort of zoom out and recognize that it's like, oh, wow, especially if your organization has different tech stacks in place, you sort of need that design system to go to those places. And what could help with that? A sturdy, trusty, Reliable style sheet. Mm. Simple elegance, my friends. So we have all of our different things, and we have ASP.NET, and we have React, and we have Angular, and we have Vue, and, and like a magical fairy, it just comes along and can convert all style, all of these different technology environments to look the same, and it's glorious. So again, nothing against that other stuff, but I do think it's really important to recognize that the portability of our styles when it comes to design system work, really, really important. Uh, now I'm going to uh, express opinions. Uh, this is a, a CSS uh, architecture that has worked pretty well for us over the years. Uh, different people have different opinions and different approaches to how to do uh, CSS, and no doubt we'll hear uh, some more about that in uh, uh, future talks and stuff like that over the next couple of days. But I just want to sort of walk through this uh, approach just because it tends to work pretty well for, for us. So one thing, just sort of deconstructing this, this uh, anatomy, if you well, it's sort of giving uh, a namespace for all things coming from the design system. Uh, uh, Salesforce Lightning Design System, they have a prefix called SLDS. Um, and we found this to be really helpful as like an identifier. It's like, oh, hey, this is coming from the design system. That's very handy, especially whenever you sort of, you know, start uh, deploying the design system to so many places. But then also, crucially, it helps sort of you know, uh, isolate those things so that it doesn't run into conflicts, right? So you're not saying button and then you introduce that button into a, a code base that already has a button and then you get a bunch of weird results. 
Uh, we also have sort of like the type of uh, classes we're sort of using. So C for components, so C dash guard, C dash button, C dash hero, stuff like that. Uh, layout for, for, or L dash for layout stuff. So, you know, L dash grid item or whatever. Uh, utility for utility classes. So these are sort of, uh, you know, single uh, properties that it's like U dash margin bottom none or something like that in order to sort of manipulate the spacing or the padding or the, the sizing or whatever it is you're, you're trying to manipulate. These are really handy tools that sort of help massage things into place, uh, which is a, a nice little extra layer that a design system could provide. Uh, is and has for sort of state-based classes, right? So it's like menu that is open or whatever, stuff like that. And then sometimes, depending on uh, the, the, the framework or the design system gig, we'll have sort of like JavaScript sort of specific handles that we sort of can latch on to. Um, from there, we use a, sort of a BEM style syntax. So we're able to say things like the button is the block, and then this double underscore means, you know, this is an icon that lives inside of the button component. And uh, here's the, the button dash dash secondary is a variant of that, and that might be that sort of ghost button or whatever, right? So uh, I've written about this, and again, this is how we tend to do things. Uh, really, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Uh, just make sure that the team is all aligned on that and you have, uh, again, sort of codified that in your uh, design system and style guide and your tooling to make sure that you're able to enforce it. Uh, another great tool is CSS guidelines. If you've, you've, you haven't been there from Harry Roberts, really fantastic and detailed uh, opinionated sort of tool on stuff like CSS architecture. Okay, now we're actually gonna design and build stuff. So can't stress enough like how important it is to sort of take your time before sort of diving into code and just sort of, you know, rocking and rolling. A lot of people are like, yeah, 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 I want to code the button. Yeah, 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 I want to do this. Oh, yeah, we're making components. And like, they want to sort of skip all that other stuff. So it's really important to sort of plan this out and make sure that you have like a solid approach in place before you actually get to building. Uh, as Sarah mentioned in the intro, uh, uh, the, wrote a book called Atomic Design. And Atomic Design is a way of sort of thinking about our user interfaces in terms of this sort of nested hierarchy. It's essentially like Russian nested nesting dolls, where it's sort of little components are included in bigger components, which are included in bigger components. And ultimately, those sort of continue uh, assembling until you end up with a full product screen. And then at the page level, you're able to sort of pour in these real product scenarios. So to sort of break that down, we sort of have components on one end, and then you sort of have the actual sort of pilot project pages, right? Those lookbook pages on sort of the other end of the spectrum. It's really crucial to understand that this is not a step-by-step -step process. This all happens concurrently. You're building the system. You're building these components through the lens of an actual working product, right? The design system is a byproduct of your product design work, right? And again, this is a trap that we see time and time again. Everybody gets focused on the components. We're building components. We're building components. It's like a huge time sink and an effort sink. All the while, you know, your products are, are really the things that should be taking priority. So uh, Gina says it really well. that The design system informs our product design. Our product design informs the design system, right? It's this really healthy, virtuous cycle between the components and the products themselves, right? So what we do is we sort of take these uh, products and one by one, right, let's say our next one is the video editor, and we're going to sort of chuck that into our, our front end workshop environment, whether it's Storybook or Pattern Lab or whatever, and we're going to sort of build the UI screens for that. And all the while, we're going to be sort of tinkering and iterating over and adding new patterns to our design system in order to build that product. And then from there, we get to sort of feed that back out into the actual product, right? We're going to do that again for the other thing and repeat that process. And like one by one, product by product, we sort of get that into our design system universe and sort of publish the components that actually help doing this. The really cool thing about this is that once you start getting more and more coverage of your entire ecosystem, you're able to, in your front end workshop environment, if you were to say make a change to the button's padding or font size or whatever, you're then able to go through all the different products that are represented in that workshop environment and see what change, right? This is where the sort of interconnected nature of things uh, really comes in handy, 
right? So there's no surprises by the time you push those changes uh, and publish them and then those individual applications like review them, right? So it helps to go, oh, the homepage is using this pattern and if we make a change here, it actually sort of looks weird on the homepage. Maybe we need to have a bigger conversation about that, right? So just like lather, rinse, repeating, getting all of that stuff sort of in there is important. Uh, so I've acquired a bunch of tools. I don't know how, uh, <laughs> but I did not go to the hardware store and just sort of go on a massive shopping spree, although that sounds like so much fun. Oh my God, that would be awesome to just go to the store and just be like, walk down every aisle and be like, one of everything, please, right? That's not how this works, right? So, so the parallel I wanna draw here is that this collection of tools is the result of various projects that I've had to do around my house for the last, I don't know, however many years, right? And the trick is, is that these tools that are sitting in my basement are sitting there, and if I need to do a new project, let's say the roof is leaking or something like that, I go down to the basement to see what I have, and I'm able to sort of do that project. But let's say uh, I don't have the tools for that, right? The toilet's overflowing, and I don't have a monkey wrench or something. Then off we go to the hardware store. My daughter loves it, my dog, he likes it for like three aisles and then he just is like tapped out. He's like, I'm done here. So, and we all like literally sort of drag him through this store because he really doesn't like, but like, I love that, that, that sort of analogy of it's like, you know, that's the sort of gist of a design system is that we want to sort of come to the design system first, see what tools we have to solve specific problems. And then if we need a new component or if we need a new thing, then we have to invest that time and energy and effort to actually go ahead and create that thing, right? So, and, but then of course, as time goes on, you want that sort of effort to sort of diminish, right? It's a sign of health where the design system sort of increasingly solves the problems you need them to solve. Um, if you want to sort of learn more about sort of what this process actually looks like, uh, uh, my colleague Dan and I, uh, we re uh, uh, recorded a video where we just sort of go back and forth, like sort of designing a new product, and we're sort of in this front-end workshop environment where building a real screen, but then setting aside those components and doing all of that. So uh, feel free to check that out. Another thing, and this is a really big shift, when we're talking about building uh, components that are going to be used by other developers uh, is that we're, we're less focused on maybe like the actual source code part of it, but it's, it's more about sort of surfacing the API for each one of these components, right? So what I mean by that is that, you know, if another developer is going to reach for the design system and the button in the design system, Right? What are they going to use? What, what properties or what's the API for this component that allows them to achieve what they're trying to achieve? Right? So things like variant primary or secondary or variant link or size large or small or you know, fixed full width and stuff. And so you could sort of mix and match some of these things. Right? So that's pretty exciting, but also just a big shift because again, we're not necessarily, of course we wanna focus on creating good front end code, but very often, a lot of times these developers are going to be sort of interacting with an abstraction of that code. So it's really important to sort of be very mindful about how we go about that process and making sure that we're calling things consistently across different uh, uh, components and stuff like that. Like uh, there's a few components we have in a, a current project we're working on now where they could have sort of dynamic tag names. So like a heading component might be an H1 or an H2 or an H3, or if it's a, uh, you know, something else you might, it's like, it's a button or it's an A tag or something like that. And we wanna make sure that that API is consistent. So it's like tag under, or tag camel case name or something like that. And we wanna make sure that that's consistent across the board. And then also crucially, we wanna sort of document that stuff, right? So things uh, like your style guide website is a really great place to sort of outline, here's the API for this component, right? Here's what things you could do with it. Here's what knobs you have to tweak for this component. Another uh, fascinating thing when we're talking about sort of delivering these sort of packaged up components is sort of how wide open or, uh, or lock down, we want these things to be, right? So we were looking at heroes earlier on nike.com and stuff like that, but like the hero component is like this big chunky image with the big fat H1 thing and it's great. Uh, 
And okay, this is pretty straightforward from a markup standpoint, right? And as a component, it might look something like this, right? So you have to identify an image source, an image alt tag, uh, a title, and a description, and that's that. But then the next product team says, okay, we're actually using this hero component on this interior page, and we need a call to action button. Okay, all right, we could do that. So we just add a new property, and then say, that sounds good. And another project team comes back and they're like, okay, how about this one? Like we want like a button group instead. So it's like, okay, we could do that. Maybe we'll add this, but it should start smelling a bit fishy here, right? You're like, yeah, because then the next team comes around and they're like, we need the newsletter sign up form or whatever. It's like, uh-oh. So the sort of, uh, it's a very interesting dance. And, you know, I don't know, like there's no sort of hard and fast rules for this, but uh, we're looking at a little React code, I guess. Um, but the sort of whole concept of children and other sort of templating language has this notion of like slots. Uh, the, the concept is the same, which basically like you're just sort of defining a box to put stuff, right? And then you could put whatever the heck you want in there. So, so this is sort of an interesting thing. And some systems need to be super duper wide open and you could put anything and everything in there. And then other systems, uh, you might want things sort of more locked down. And even the components inside of that uh, uh, design system might need to be on the spectrum of sort of wide open or locked down. Another thing is we want to bake in the best practices. Like one of the best things about having this sort of consumable design system is that you're able to sort of bake in responsive design best practices, performance best practices, accessibility best practices, UX best practices, front end best practices into this component. And then whenever that other developer reaches for that and plugs it into their site, they get that stuff for free. And this is huge. And I think especially huge when it comes to enforcing accessibility. Right, So this is uh, something that we've found to be really fun in our work, especially because we're dealing with like a lot of back-end developers and people that aren't maybe as, as familiar with accessibility best practices. It's like, great, we could sort of take care of that stuff and they could use it and get this stuff for free. So one cool thing you're able to do, um, this is uh, another React-specific thing, but like whatever, you, you could do this for, for any uh, sort of framework or, or whatever. There's this concept of like prop types or defining what type of uh, uh, variables you have in here. So we could basically say uh, an image alt is a string and crucially it's required. And what that means is that if a developer sort of takes that component and plugs it in and doesn't define an alt text, it yells at them. It breaks their build. So you get to be like the disciplinarian without even being there. How cool is that, right? You're scaling your yelling. <laughs> pretty cool. Another cool thing, uh, also accessibility related, is like we could, again, sort of bake this, this practice in. Um, uh, sort of, we all know that labels should have, you know, uh, uh, four, uh, you know, sort of you, you create a relationship between the label and the input field, but then you also have stuff like this where you might have additional instructions for a field, right? And if you just have a paragraph tag, it doesn't create that association. Choose a password, secure, edit text. You are currently on a text field inside of web content. To enter text in this field, type. Should have warned you for that, sorry. But that's voiceover. And you can see that it doesn't read those additional instructions there. So that's a problem. So what we want to do is we want to sort of add these other instructions so that uh, it create a relationship between the input and those other instructions. So now with that in place. Choose a password, secure edit text. Your password must be at least eight characters long. Yeah. You are currently on a text field inside of web content. To enter text in this field, type. That's cool, right? So then what ends up happening, though, is that you know, now the user, uh, the developer, has to remember to, to add this ID uh, uh, attribute in this area described by attribute. And that actually might be, might be a little too much. So what we could do is say, if the, the developer identifies these properties, so it's like last name and aria described by last name instructions, then that, that works and that sort of accepts those values. But if they don't, if they omit those IDs, this little component will actually sort of generate its own unique ID for them, right? So a little bit of gobbledygook. So that's awesome because now you can't screw it up, right? You'd still probably screw it up if you were to like really mess with it. But like the idea is that you're trying to make it easier to enforce these accessibility and best practices across the board without the developers, the user developers, having to do too much. Okay. Launching a design system. What does it mean to launch a design system? 
right? Nathan Curtis talks about this, that a design system isn't a project with an end, but it's rather a product that serves other products. So deploying a design system means actually getting it into real applications, right? Using tools like package managers, like a, a Composer and NPM and stuff like that. So we're able to sort of take and publish our design system to you know, these, these package managers, distribute it, bundle it all up, right? And then actually sort of install that uh, uh, design system into our actual projects, right? So now a developer can take it, install it, import the button, use that stuff, and all, that, all is good, right? And then the last thing I'm going to say is the maintenance is incredibly important. And the, the thing to say, uh, to keep in mind with respect to maintaining a design system is that, again, this is a product. So this is a little bit different than, hey, we launched the new project, like, have a nice day, see you in three to five years when we redesign it, <laughs> right? Instead, it's like, oh, wow, I'm now on the hook to sort of like, uh, uh, you know, sort of maintain this thing over time. And that's where things like versioning and semantic versioning comes into play. Really recommend uh, Nathan Curtis's six-part uh, series on deploying design systems. He gets all in the weeds about that stuff. But ultimately, right, <laughs> we're going to like sort of get into all of these different uh, uh, tools and technologies and have to sort of repeat this process for our non-React environments and sort of create like a Drupal-specific flavor and some other stuff like that, but really sort of keeping in mind that like tools and technologies change and today's new hotness is not tomorrow's new hotness. So we need to sort of build that for scale. So it gets even crazier because this, you know, once you get native into the mix, you get all sorts of stuff, right? It, if you look at this, it's like, this just seems bananas, right? It just seems like, you know, it's conspiracy theory or like drawing a bunch of really complex graphs on, on this, this uh, you know, <laughs> on the whiteboard and stuff. It's like, but this is the truth. Like, it's a lot of effort to sort of create and maintain a design system that's meant to power an entire organization's code base. So to wrap up, need to make sure that your design system lives in the technologies that your products live, right? Look at your product roadmaps and identify those pilot projects. Establish code conventions and use tooling to enforce them. Build your design system around those pilot projects and, and sort of build that in a front-end workshop environment. Bake best practices into your components and then deploy them out. Right? Use semantic versioning to sort of you know, maintain that and sort of create it, make an easier path for developers to adopt and update things. And also, we didn't get a chance to cover this, but design tokens are really helpful for sort of bridging the gap between all these different web environments and even native environments as well. But for as hard as this is, I encourage you to just sort of start somewhere, even if it's just like that one pilot project, right? Just take that first step, right? Create those like first set of components and use that to sort of build that project. And then the next time around, sort of lather, rinse, repeat, right? So. It doesn't all happen at once, right? It takes a good long effort and a lot of concentration to make this happen. So with that, everyone, thank you so much for your time. Good stuff, good stuff. But Brad, react. React. <laughs> react, that's all I'll say. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. It's it's a phenomenon. <laughs> I don't know what what else to say about it. It's like I sort of held out for as long as I could, and I, I'm I'm trying to start to to sort of write a little bit more about it. Um, I, I wrote a post called "My Struggle to Learn React" yep. and uh, had like the entire React community sort of jump down my throat about it. Uh, apparently, saying something is hard and and yeah. you know is is uh, you know insulting the people that make it or so, I don't know. It's, it's a very strange thing. Um, but at the same time, it's just uber popular. I've sort of made peace with it though, just because again, like once you have components or reusable components, if Vue is the next hotness, which like I, I look at Vue and I'm like, oh, that seems to make good sense. I, I sort of like that. It becomes like way less effort to sort of say, okay, here's our card built in React. Let's just bring that over into view or whatever. But even better yet, it's like you have like web components and stuff. So it's like once you have like the API and you've done all that hard work of sort of saying, here's the dynamic bits, here's how we're structuring this, 
it becomes easy to just sort of like move from one to the other. So really like the idea of like sort of consumable components. And as it happens, apparently right now, React is, is the way a lot of folks are doing that. So I guess I'll play ball. <laughs> it's a little weird still, but. I, right now, I am trying to suppress my opinions. <clears throat> it's very hard. <laughs> okay, so just one basic question. At which point do you decide that an organization or a product could benefit from a design system? Like, is it the size of the company, the number of the websites, or what? I, honestly, I think any, any product, any project can benefit from a design system. Like, not everything, uh, Hakeem said it really well, actually. He's like, he's like yeah, we, we're just two people, so we don't have the, the, the bandwidth to sort of make this like full-on design system. And I, I heard that, and I was like, oh, that's interesting, because you then showed the design system, right? Mm -hmm. And for a company of two, that's great, but you can still, it's still component-based architecture and like talking about the benefits of all of that. Even for like my wife's fourth page uh, a business web page, like I used Pattern Lab, I created components, and then like the first page, it was 100% effort. The second page was like 80% effort. The mm. third page was like 30% effort. And by the fourth page, I had all the components I need to just sort of assemble them and be done with it. So like, I, I honestly can't see uh, like any use case, honestly, where it's like, oh, we like don't need any of that. But I think that there's a misconception that like every design system has to be material design or lightning design system. It's like those are obviously for like huge organizations and they need to have more firepower and be more comprehensive because they have a lot more people. But as long as you're sort of thinking at whatever scale, you're thinking about reuse and components, and, and components, components that's yeah. it. That's yeah. it. That's cool. cool. That's pretty great. Thank you. All thanks right. So thanks much. so much. Thank you. Thanks, all.